So good morning, uh, everyone, and uh, good evening to the colleagues uh, who are from the US. Um, so I'm really uh, very, very happy to have my old friend, Professor Peter Fischer, uh, as a um, speaker today in our uh, webinar series on spintronics, which is uh, really going, I would say, very well since last seven, eight months, because uh, people like Peter <coughs> are very collaborative and very cooperative uh, uh, to give talks uh, almost in a very late hour. I'm sorry, uh, Peter, that you have to stay uh, awake uh, so late. Um, and uh, uh, today we just had uh, the lecture from uh, Professor Ramon Tiromes in the quantum matter heterostructures, which is just going in parallel to this event as well. Uh, and it's really nice to hear two talks from uh, Bay Area <laughs> almost the same day. It's wonderful. Uh, so you may know Professor Peter Fischer very, very well. He is a big, big expert in uh, magnetic uh, spectro X-ray spectroscopies at Advanced Light Source in Berkeley. Nevertheless, I would like to give a very, very brief introduction about his career. So uh, Professor Peter Fischer received his PhD degree in physics, that's Dr. Redna, from the Technical University in Munich in Germany in 1993 on pioneering work with X-ray magnetic circular dichroism that's known as XMCD in rare earth systems. And his habilitation from the University of Würzburg in Germany in 2000, based on his pioneering work on magnetic soft X-ray microscopy. Since 2004, he is with the material science division at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory in Berkeley, California. He is a senior staff scientist and principal investigator in the non-equilibrium magnetic materials program and serves as the Deputy Division Director at the Material Science Division. His research program is focused on the use of polarized synchrotron radiation for the study of fundamental problems in magnetism. Since 2014, he is also adjunct professor for physics at the University of California in Santa Cruz. Professor Fischer has published more than 210 peer-reviewed papers and has given more than 320 invited presentations at national and international conferences. He was nominated as the Distinguished Lecturer of the IEEE Magnetic Society for the year 2011. For his achievements of hitting the 10 nanometer resolution milestone with soft X-ray microscopy, he has received the Klaus Halbach Award at the Advanced Light Source in Berkeley in 2010. Professor Fischer is also the Fellow of the American Physical Society and the IEEE Society. So with this brief introduction, so uh, I invite you on behalf of my team and uh, uh, we will have the lecture uh, uh, about 45 to 50 minutes. After that, we will take all the questions. Uh, so kindly bear with us if you have any questions till the end. So with this uh, small introduction, I'm again uh, expressing my sincere gratitude uh, to Peter and requesting you to give your lecture. Looking forward to your lecture. Thank you. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Supanka, and um, good morning to uh, India and wherever you are listening to this uh, seminar talk. Uh, I'm, I'm really honored to be able to, in this difficult times, to you know, talk to you about research that I'm very excited about, and hopefully you will also uh, feel the excitement uh, when I talk about our latest results on the novel topological spin textures, which I'm going to show you here. Um, you know, it's been a while since I was in India and time runs fast, but I really hope that there's a time that I will go back to and, and see you all in person. Anyway, um, I'm looking forward to this. Okay, um, so I'm going to talk about, you know, let's put it this way, work that I've been doing at the Advanced Light Source, which you see here in the background of this image. And of course, yeah, I mean, the day today was again like this. We had beautiful sunshine, but you know, you're in India, I mean, that's not um, too special, but we still love it. And the, and the view from the ELS, which is this round building in the dome, uh, is is a, a very um, nice place where you can do experiments. And it's a open to the world user facility, the brightest uh, light source, the brightest uh, source of soft X-rays. And I'm doing particularly magnetic X-ray spectrum microscopies. And what I'm really interested in, looking to novel topological spin textures. I want to mention that this work that I'm presenting here is funded by the Office of science at the Department of Energy within this non-equilibrium magnetic materials program. And I also would like to um, let you know that Berkeley Lab um, started 90 years ago, which maybe for some of you doesn't look like a lot, but for us it's a big achievement. 
And if you're interested, I encourage you to go to the website and check out all these activities and the history of Berkeley Lab. It's an amazing place. And I would like to invite you at some point to just come and, and take a look and be part of this. So the outline of my talk is, uh, I'm gonna talk about three different topics. One is novel topological spin textures, which I think are getting more and more, I mean, in, in, in the focus of the research in the spintronics community particularly. And you will see that we have now a new spin texture that we can create and characterize and understand which are fascinating uh, scientifically, but might also have some technological applications. Uh, then I will talk briefly about uh, a new area that's just emerging, which uh, we call 3D topological spin textures. That means we're going into the full three-dimensional space um, and, and look into very exotic and, and, and fascinating topological spin textures. And uh, then I will show you how we can image those, how we can see them in 3D statically, but also, and this is another area that I feel is, is absolutely exciting, is going to an ultra fast time scale where we were able to share with you some results on ultra fast fluctuations of these exotic spin textures or novel uh, topological spin textures using, I would say, um, probably the latest uh, development and achievements in X-ray science. These are the free electron lasers and we were using the one that is operational in, in Stanford. So this gives you a little uh, broad overview of uh, what I'm gonna share with you in the next uh, you know, 45 minutes or so. And I would say if you have any urgent questions in, me in the meantime, just feel free to you know, either raise your hand or just uh, um, open your mic and, and, and ask the question directly. Otherwise, I'm happy to answer the question at the end of the talk. Now, this is a very general introduction. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I guess most of you are very familiar with this, but I mean, we just need to know and understand magnetic materials really impact our life. And there's just these broad, you know, a uh, range of applications where even if you don't know it, and you know, general, sometimes the general public doesn't even know this, but they are penetrating and they are so important. And uh, they really go from high performance permanent magnet same motors. I mean, when you talk about, you know, electric vehicles and things like that, generators for power, what would they look like without magnetic materials with high performance down to the very nanoscale magnetic structures. And this really has definitely, I mean, a biggest impact on magnetic information technologies, storage logic and sensor devices. So in a nutshell, magnetic materials really impact our life tremendously, but we are, we are researchers, we are scientists. We think about what could be the future look like for magnetic materials. And to address this question, well, you need to just from, the, from a conceptual point of view, look into what makes the material a material. And in the end, that's the electron. And what makes it a magnetic material? Well, the electron doesn't have just a charge, but it also has to spin. And with this, this in the end is in a nutshell, the reason why there's spintronics. We want to use the spin degrees of freedom to play with the spins, to put them in a certain transport mode, uh, control them, um, excite them and things like that. And this then of course would lead us to the spintronics, which we're already, I mean, using, but there's much more to come. And particular when you look and when, when you consider that what is really a limitation of electronics. Electronics, no doubt, has been one of the biggest success stories probably over the last hundred years. Uh, they only use the charge degree of freedom, but what is really, let's call it annoying, is whenever you move charge currents around, that means you have a transport of charges. And that's what you do finally in any circuits, um, you know, chips and things like that. You have Ohm's losses. That means you, you lose more or less by design energy. And this of course is, um, is, is a critical problem. And that's why I, I truly believe that a way out from this, what we call the beyond Moore's law limit. And if you heard uh, Ramesh talking today uh, at the other conference, maybe he's also talked about this. Maybe the spin gives you a, a way out from having low power electronics by using much more advanced spintronics uh, devices. And this is, I think in the end, also what drives us from a more you know, society, economic, and, uh, you know, I mean, many aspects that we have to look into being a scientist. Um, but of course, as a scientist who is interested in fundamentals is what, what makes a magnetic material a magnetic material? And of course, it is all about how do the spins align in, in, on, a macroscopic, uh, on a microscopic scale. So the spin textures really are the foundation of any uh, properties, behavior, or function of magnetic materials. And with this, of course, the devices that are built from that. And I think you all know, I mean, you heard it from, you know, undergrad classes probably, uh, yeah, can have two spins that call them S1 and S2. And when they couple to each other, a very simple coupling is by 
basically because they're both vectors, I mean, spin is a vector quantity, um, put them together by a scalar product, that's the mathematics behind it, which means if you think about what is a ground state of these two spins when they're coupled by this uh, kind of exchange interaction, well, it depends a little bit on a materials constant or exchange constant, whether it's positive or negative, and you can easily derive from there, this is the Heisenberg model, a ferromagnet material, an antiferromagnetic material, or even a ferry magnet material, because as I said, the spin is a vector, which has both an orientation as well as a, as, a, as a size, a magnitude, and therefore you can build the three very fundamental magnetic materials. And they have been used, they have been studied, they have been explored for decades now. Now, what is new, and this is just coming very recently, maybe over the last 10 years or so, a little more than that, but anyway, it's very exciting. So from a mathematical point of view, I mean, these two spins, you cannot just couple by the scalar product, which of course gives this parallel and anti-parallel alignment, but you can also put a cross product in between. And with this, you arrive immediately to the non-collinear um, uh, orientation of spins, because all of a sudden, when you do this, the minimum energy of two spins that couple by this um, kind of antisymmetric exchange coupling, that's how we call it, because if you switch S1 and S2, this kind of interaction changes its sign, well, you end up with a non-collinear uh, kind of orientation of neighboring spins to be in the ground state of energy. And of course, this has to do with spin orbit coupling, and it has also some constant that goes with this, the scale somehow, the strength of this. Now, the thing is, you can play with those two. Basically, by combining or you know, bring the exchange, the symmetric and the anti-symmetric exchange interactions into, into, into the game and, and tuning those interactions, you can really discover new materials where then the spin texture, which is the foundation, will not look anymore either parallel, anti-parallel or candid, but it could be anything in between. And this is a route, a path for discovering novel materials, but just tuning those interactions. And it has to do with broken inversion symmetry that happens, for instance, at interfaces. And therefore, Magnetic multilayers are at uh, these days very again uh, keep be, uh, keep to be very interesting to study even these novel spin textures. Now and basically derived from that, there's now a whole zoo of, of non-trivial spin textures. Then and I just plotted a, a few of them here: vortices, uh, domain walls, of course, and then the skirmions. The skirmions is a very interesting topic, and I will talk more about this in uh, throughout my talk. Uh, very interesting uh, spin configuration where the magnetization actually makes a full rotation when you go through the skirmions. Um, there's block points that are very interesting to look at. And quite recently, I mean, there was also structures, and I will talk about this towards the end of my talk, hopfions. And I will explain a little bit what a spin texture of a hopfion would look like. Uh, you probably heard from Ramesh a little bit about multiferroics, topological insulators, Kyle Boppers. Well, that has to do something with the skirmins. I won't talk about those too much, but I'll show you there's a whole kind of variety of spin texture that are very interesting to look at. Now, let me now share with you one other thought is, so this kind of, um, you know, very fundamental consideration of how neighboring spins couple and uh, how they basically align. Well, that is true for kind of planar systems. But if you put them, let's say, in a, in a curved geometry on a curved surface, and this could happen um, on, by design, let's say, on, a, on the surface of a nanowire or on a sphere, things like that. Well, what it means is that all of a sudden, um, an exchange interaction, which you might think is parallel, turns out to be no longer really just parallel because put two spins on a curved surface, those who are just I mean, coupling by exchange, well, they do have an angle and all of a sudden they also have an interfacial DMI on this curved surface. So what I'm saying is by adding now to a, a planar surface that the radius, the curvature, you end up with a completely new uh, kind of a degree of freedom that you can play with. And this is what is really exciting. But that means you have to go from the two-dimensional systems, which so far have, have been studied mostly in, in magnetic multilayers, you really have to go into the full 3D kind of space and, and, and analyze and, and, and take advantage of the spins being in these uh, kind of, you know, completely new uh, uh, configurations in a, on a curved surface. So, for instance, on a flat surface, I want to repeat it, in-plane spins cannot simply interact through DMI because there is no DMI, but on a curved surface, these in-plane spins can interact through a, what I call a curvature-induced DMI. So this is a completely new way of playing with the spins and, and creating new structures and new spin textures. 
And there was just a recent paper, um, for those of you interested, where they found, for instance, that a domain wall, which, you know, in a planar geometry would be pretty straightforward, uh, in a cylindrical geometry, all of a sudden would look very different. For instance, they have a, a character that is both of a block as well as an ale. It's a mixture of those. And interestingly, these domain walls are also inclined if you have something like this, you know, kind of an um, 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 kind of a shell or um, um, kind of a, a boundary around a nanowire that is at an angle like this one here. And the angle itself is shown by these graphs here is kind of almost a, met, uh, um, a measure of this kind of mixing of block and ale character. So this is, I think, again, uh, an, an, an opportunity and an avenue to, to study a curvilinear magnetism um, in, in, in these new uh, things. And of course, this by itself um, is now the, the start of a completely new dimension that we're exploring and we're starting to explore. Uh, I mean, there's a really an emerging field of magnetism in, in 3D uh, where we go from the traditional multi-layer 2D things, uh, kind of disk structures into the 3D space by artificially designing um, geometries, textures that have a completely new, uh, you know, performance and, and behavior and, and properties. And uh, of course, this is not, I want to be very explicit here, this is not going back into a crystal structure where nature itself basically provides a three-dimensional orientation of the spins. This is now done by design, by by, by fabrication, nanofabrication on a nanoscale, you design, just to give you one example, a Möbius band. Uh, don't ask me how to do this. I'm pretty sure soon we'll be able to do something like this. And there you have, of course, a spin texture that looks completely different than what you would know from just a plain strip that you put flat on, 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 on a flat surface. So these are really challenges for both the synthesis, characterization, computation, but it's also a great opportunity for new physics and application, and and my group and you know and man, amongst many others are right now very interested and excited about looking into the opportunities that emerge from these going in, in a in a in a designed in a, in a tailored in in a really um, in, a, in a dedicated uh, 3D dimension here, and uh, just to I mean show you a few examples of what people have already done, advanced synthesis of those non-trivial spin textures in 3D. Uh, of course, there are like nanotubes that are grown by a chemical uh, process, or you can just grow a, a regular nano wire, but you put them on a on a kind of a tilted uh, a substrate and start rotating the substrate while the, the, the wire is growing. That means you generate something like a spiral. And this is then electron holography that shows you the spin texture inside this kind of curved wire. And this was work. Uh, can I, how does this work here? Can I do this again? Anyway. Um, the, this roll of mag magnetic tubes also show you that the, the spin texture in here changes completely uh, when you put these uh, the films that were first flat on a substrate and roll them up like a plastic foil and the spin texture really changes. Uh, here we go, it's, 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 you know, it's a tomography, uh, extra tomography image here. Uh, and then there's also um, a technique that's called focused electron beam induced deposition. And this is just a beautiful review article uh, by the group uh, from, I believe, Oak Ridge, where they have shown beautiful examples how you can manufacture by almost a cat-like design, really fascinating new structures. And just imagine these are all now, I mean, made up of, of uh, magnetic materials with the spins. And then you just have to think about like a buckyball of a spin eye system and what's the spin texture look like in these. Okay, now let me go a little bit back to the flat films again, uh, the 2D systems, and let's talk briefly about uh, one of the spin texture that really is, is so exciting, these are the skirmions. Now the skirmions, as I mentioned, are characterized basically by a, a full rotation of the magnetization when you go from left to right. Uh, now they were found first by Flatter and, and a, really a groundbreaking paper, 2013, in very exotic materials. In, in, a, in a crystal structure P20 phase, they had an inversion symmetry broken, but only happened at very low temperatures. Now, in the meantime, uh, we have, and let's say we, our community has demonstrated and shown that you can also generate those kind of uh, skirmion textures in multi-layered films where you have interfacial uh, jaloshinsky mori interaction. Now, uh, the topology comes basically from this, in the spin texture comes because there is, and you can quantify this, by what's called a skirmion winding number. So this is the description shown here. Basically, it's the cross product between this derivative of the, the m and, and x and y. And what it means is you have a, 
an integer number that is associated with the topology. Now, why is this important? Well, it looks like that this topology provides protection and it, it could generate, and this is a famous work by Albert Fair, uh, one of the Nobel Prize winners uh, in, in, in physics, um, and where there's clearly here, there's a simulation showing that there is a, a way by using the experiments to generate small, fast units that are topologically protected and that could create to low power devices. So again, you have with the experiments with the topological protection, a, a path for discovering not only new materials, but also new magnetic materials and spin texture, but also maybe find them to be applied in, in, in new spintronics uh, devices, which of course would definitely satisfy a lot of the problems we're facing right now. So this was a little introduction because I will talk more about the skirmions and what we have done so far with skirmions. But let me just sh show you a little bit an overview how we use X-rays to characterize those very novel topological spin textures. And um, this is a, a summary that shows basically what X-rays can do by using their, their various properties. Now, X-rays, they do have wavelengths. Um, that is typically for soft X-rays around, let's call it one kilo, kilo electron volts in the one nanometer range, and it can go down to about an angstrom regime in the hard X-rays. Which means that whatever you do with X-rays, you should be probing deeply nanoscale science. And of course, for magnetic materials, that's important because in this few nanometer regime, it's typically fundamental magnetic length scales like exchange lengths. Now you can um, use this wavelengths to study 2D and also 3D um, images of spin textures. And I will show you a few examples in my next slides. And then the, because there's in the, in the latest generation of X-ray sources, there's a lot of coherence. Actually, it's all about making the X-rays coherent. So you can study also co spatial correlations in, in the spin texture, for instance, and spectral patterns. Now, X-rays, particularly those that are generated as uh, synchrotrons or free electron lasers or other sources are, have a very specific time structure. And this time structure is given by, let's say, the bunches of electrons that generate the X-rays. So you have flashes of X-rays. And they allow you to do, to set up some time ex uh, ex experiments where you can study down to almost the femtosecond time regime, the dynamics of the system that you're interested in. And if, again, femtoseconds is a very fundamental, it's, it's, it relates to the exchange time in a ferromagnet. Uh, you can do it either by a pump probe geometry. I'll show you one example uh, in my next slide, but you can also study them again because of the coherence the time, the, the temporal correlations. And, and I'll show this in, in at the very end of my talk, you can also study the spin fluctuations at these nanoscales. So this is a completely new way of looking into magnetic materials at fundamental lengths and time scales with a very high spatial and temporal resolution. Intensity-wise, X-rays are bosons. You can pack as many as you want in, in any you know, phase um, space. Uh, but that also means that the amount of x-rays that you can use allow you to tackle very small cross-sections. It means small effects should be easily to detect with x-rays. That's different, for instance, with neutrons. That, in the end, should allow us to do single-shot imaging. So that means we can study dynamic processes that are probably single events, and we might be able to even characterize them. Intensity, of course, means also uh, talk about damage. I'm not talking this, but because particularly for magnetic materials, it's not so much of an issue. Now, what is really important for studying magnetic materials with x-rays is its polarization. And with the polarization, that gives you, that's similar like a Kerr effect, but it's now in the x-ray regime. And it's just a different wavelengths. Um, we have magnetic sensitivity and we have what's called a magnetic circular dichroism effect, which is related to the circular polarization of the x-rays or a linear dichroism effect. And with those two effects, we can study both ferro, ferry, as well as anti-ferromagnets. And we can also study canted spins because the x-ray processes, the interaction of the polarized x-rays with the magnetic materials, and you will see this in my next slide, um, is, is, is depending on the, the, the relative uh, orientation of the X-rays projected onto the magnetic moment or magnetic moments projected onto the uh, direction of the X-rays. So we can also study kind of the direction of the spins. And finally, the energy of the X-rays, which of course relates to the wavelengths, um, gives us inherent elemental specificity. This is a characteristic, a characteristic of X-rays that I think is hard to achieve with any other techniques because um, X-rays interact in a very specific way with different materials. That means if you have a multi-component materials, you can pick up a, a specific uh, response signal from the 
uh, from the uh, system you're interested in. And we can study both amplitude and phase. Again, this goes back to the coherence. So in the end, coherence, where's my pointer here? Here we go. Coherence is kind of the keyword for future experiments with X-rays and keep that in mind. And all the free electron lasers that are just emerging right now, the, the main goal and also ELS has an upgrade project. This is all about increasing the coherence, both longitudinal as well as the, the, the spatial uh, coherence. Okay, very briefly, probably most of you have seen this already. Uh, the contrast mechanism that we need for imaging is based on extra magnetic circular dichroism. I, I mentioned it before. This is uh, the kind of the counterpart of a, a magneto optical curve effect, but now we're in the X-ray regime. And to make it very short, um, what you will observe is um, the X-rays when they come in with a certain energy, um, they match. And when they match the binding energy of an inner core electron, this electron gets excited, ejected, or trans transferred into a, a state at the Fermi level. And then if you have, let's say, a spin split um, you know, band structure here, that means there's more states available for one or the other orientation of the, uh, the spin polarization. Uh, and that means that your absorption profile, which, which for non-polarized X-rays would just look like this. You have this famous absorption edges. That means right here at the so-called L3 edge, this matches exactly the binding energy of the 2P3 half electron and then spin orbit coupling separated at the L2 edge. This is where you where the X-rays, the incoming X-rays match the binding energies of these 2P1 half electrons. By just analyzing the L3 and the L2 edge, you learn about the kind of, um, you know, um, uh, density of, of states at the, you know, uh, with the P3 three half and the P1 half electronic levels. Now, when you turn on the polarization, you see a difference in the absorption coefficient. And this depends now whether the magnetization of your system, the magnetic moments are parallel to the elicity of the photons, negative, positive, or anti-parallel. And what you see here are two graphs. Again, this is the absorption profile as a function of, of photon energy for a specific element. In that case, it's cobalt. And whether it's parallel or anti-parallel, the helicity relative to the uh, local magnetic moments, there's more or less absorption. That means you have a huge contrast. Look at the scale here. It's almost about a factor two at cobalt here at this specific L3 edge, which means you should be able to, di to distinguish between the up and the down, the back and the forth spin uh, pointing in, in forward or backward direction of the uh, direction of the X-rays. And Interestingly, if you just compare the spin orbit partners, the L3, L2, which is just the difference between 2P3 half and 2P1 half, it flips the sign. So you go from a negative excess for the L3 to positive excess at the L2. Now, what, that, what does that mean is that you can, by analyzing those two areas here, the A3 and the A2, you can derive quantitatively by just looking at absorption spectroscopy spin moments and orbital moments in an element-specific way because that happens only at very spe uh, element-specific photon energy. So this was a big, big breakthrough in the 1990s when this was discovered and people were able, by doing this relatively simple experiment of X-ray spectroscopy, turn on the polarization and measure um, uh, magnetic materials. And you arrive with spin and orbital magnetic moments, fundamental quantities of magnetism. Okay, now this contrast that I just described here can also be used then for imaging. And there has been a whole zoo of, you know, techniques being developed that use this XMCD and XMLD contrast for imaging the spin texture with a spatial resolution, because as I mentioned two slides earlier, the length scales of these X-rays is in the nanometer regime. That means the spatial resolution that ultimately can be achieved with X-ray microscopies is in the nanometer regime. And that's, of course, the, the, the length scale of interest for magnetic imaging. Uh, plus, you get the elemental specificity for free, more or less. And there's a, a couple of what I call real space imaging techniques. Some of them use X-ray optics, Fresnel zone plates, full field and transmission scanning microscopy. And there's also this famous X-ray PEAM, a photo emission electron microscopy, which detects secondary electrons that be generated in this absorption profile and they send them through an electron lens and onto a detector. These three techniques, they're all available around the world at almost any synchrotron these days. And then quite recently, people really got interested in using again the coherence to not do real space imaging, but what we call reciprocal space imaging. So you basically go into the K space in, into diffraction mode of imaging. And there's of course a couple of techniques 
the coherent diffractive imaging technique, the X-ray holography can be considered as one of them, and also the X-ray tachography, which is basically a scanning transmission X-ray microscope, but now instead of just taking point by point, measure the, let's say, transmission or fluorescence or emitted electrons, and then raster scan across the sample, you take for each of the rest of the scanning points a full diffraction pattern, and then you analyze the data and put them in a kind of retrieval algorithm to finally, and this is what I want to show you in this slide here, you can even get um, a real space image of the spin texture, but with even increased spatial resolution. So here's just a comparison, a full field soft X-ray microscope that I've been using a lot, and I think Supanka also remember at the time when he came to Berkeley, uh, where we just put the sample into the beam, and you have a setup sim similar like an optical microscope. There's the X-ray source, a condensosome plate focuses down onto the sample, and there's a microsome plate uh, that basically generates an image onto a CCD camera, and within a few seconds you get a domain pattern or an image of the domain pattern where, as you can see here, this black and white areas means your magnetization because we're using XMCD as the contrast mechanism. Black and white means the magnetic moments at this location point in this in the forward direction, and the black, let's say, point in the opposite direction or vice versa, depending on the polarization of the X-rays. Now take that same sample, which was a thin film of semi iron cobalt, into a scanning microscope and do this what's called soft X-ray tachography technique. You generate diffraction patterns. And one of them just looks like this, but you take about, I don't know, 2000, whatever. I mean, you scan across uh, a field of view and you, you generate diffraction, 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 thousands of them, and then you start analyzing and you reconstruct from the diffraction images, the, uh, the real space images. And you can do this both in absorption and phase contrast because now you have an over, I mean, uh, oversampled uh, kind of system and you're able to bring in by design from the from the analysis, um, the, the, the phase contrast and the amplitude contrast, which you cannot do with a single optics. You would have to do some tricks to do it with optics. And now what is interesting here, just to sh share a little bit some details here, the amplitude contrast, of course, when you vary the energy across this cobalt edge, as I showed you earlier, um, follows more or less the contrast. That means the, the stronger the contrast, the stronger the XMDD signal is here. And as you can imagine, at the resonant edge, this was a 778.6, for those of you who paid close attention, this is where the contrast is strongest, and it's a little less the contrast before and after. Now, when you look at the phase, and of course, amplitude and phase are related by a so-called Kramers chronic relationship, you see a different behavior. There, and this is also drawn here by the, the red dots and the blue dots, the blue is actually the, uh, the, the phase, and the, the red is, is the amplitude. There, at this resonant edge, you see almost no contrast, while there is a strong contrast just slightly before the edge, and then a reverse contrast after the edge. So what you take home from there is there's various, way, various ways to analyze the contrast, and you have different approaches to study them. That means you should have complementary information. Cut the, uh, cut the story short, I mean, this allowed us to even push the spatial resolution further down because it's this oversampling and you have just more information that you can analyze. So this is, um, we feel this might be a way to push the spatial resolution to the ultimate limit, which is the diffraction limit. That means the wavelengths of the X-rays. X-ray optics have not yet been able to get there. That's because it's very, you know, challenging, put it this way, to generate high resolution optics. Now, um, you can also use the, the time structure of the synchrotron to do time-resolved X-ray microscopy. Um, and the way it works is um, the electrons inside the storage ring that generate these X-ray pulses are coming little bunches. So when you now uh, kind of link or use a trigger signal from the storage ring, feed a pulse generator, generate um, electric, let's say pumping uh, pulse, and you feed this through a waveguide into a spin texture, you will excite and it could be either a field-driven or a spin-torque-driven uh, excitation of the dynamics. And then you basically will take snapshots at a specific delay time between the pump and the probe, and you generate image after image, and they will show you, because you have a high spatial and temporal resolution that's about 100 picosecond, or probably a little less than that, so you will be able to take snapshot images at these, let's call it 100 picosecond resolution, and you scan through the time, and by that you, you, you image the time evolution of a spin dynamics on a nanoscale that allows you because of the, the spin dynamics. Now keep in mind, 
This means this technique of pump probe only allows you to look into fully repeatable dynamics because the number of photons in one of these pulses here is just not enough to generate a full field image of your system. But nevertheless, I mean, we've studied and many other people have studied as well, vortex dynamics, which is a very regular kind of gyrational motion. And, and that is a, a beautiful example how you can use both the spatial resolution of the X-ray microscopy as well as the time resolution that comes with the storage rings and the synchrotrons to study uh, gyrational motion of uh, uh, you know, vortex structures. People looked into spin wave dynamics as well. Uh, and people also, I mean, looked into repeatable uh, you know, dynamics so far. Okay, and this is one example which we have done, and this was done together with uh, Song Hong Wu um, uh, a while ago. We looked into spinoid driven uh, skirmion dynamics. So, what we did is we generated uh, skirmions in a platinum cold iron boron magnesium oxide uh, kind of uh, thin layer structure uh, by applying a certain pulse sequence. We were able to generate, and you can see this little dot here. This is a little one of the skirmions, the one that I showed you earlier, the schematics. And then we basically excited them with a pulse. And this is the pulse sequence that we excited. And what you see, and let me see if I can run this movie again. There we go. So you see now dynamics that go, it's going on on, on on the skirmion. And again, this is a 100 nanometer length scale roughly. And you see how it starts to really breathe up and down as a function of the, of the, the time between the pump and the probe, right? But what was interesting is that when we increased the amplitude of this excitation pulse, well, the motion changed. It went from here, you saw the breathing up mode, which was kind of, you know, going up and down. This was then more into a current induced translational motion. So what we were able to show in, in this paper here is that by adjusting the excitation pulse, the amplitude, uh, we can really kind of modify on demand the kind of dynamic response of this skirmion. So that means on a, a nanoscale spin texture responded in a very specific way on our driving force. And I think this is an interesting um, you know, um, uh, uh, opportunity because it allows us to study now in detail the, the, the skirmion dynamics uh, with these uh, time-resolved X microscopy. Now, let me talk a little bit about more skirming numbers and the winding numbers and to give you a little idea why we want to move a little further than just looking into this uh, individual skirmions here. Now, the winding number of a closed loop basically answers the question, how many times is a direction vector on the loop uh, going around in circles? And this is this, I mean, it's not just one. It can, let's say here's an example where it actually does two rotations. But the winding number will always be a multiple of two pi on a closed loop. Now, relate this to the skirmions, and you've seen this before. Uh, there, I, I showed you the winding number of a vector field, um, and we had this skirmion number defined, and here it would be just one because it goes one full rotation of, of the, the spin orientation, and this is the n equal one topological uh, winding number of a regular skirmion. But, well, uh, it doesn't have to be just one, and this is work that has been even looked into, I mean, many, many years ago by really one of our probably most famous, you know, you know, pioneers and, and, and pioneers in, in, uh, in you know, ma magnetic domain structure. And I'm pretty sure you all are familiar with, you know, the book by uh, Alex Hubert. And he, together with Alex Bogdanov, already looked into multiple rotations of the magnetization. And they did, I think they, they called them back then the, the pi vortices. Uh, in the meantime, we call them target skirmions because they look a little bit like, you know, a target. And this is an, a kind of a simulation of um, one rotation in the skirmion, that's uh, the well-known skirmion I just described. But what happens if you just make not just one, but two rotations or three and so on and so forth. And this is something that we looked into our group uh, a while ago, 2019. And uh, how do we actually make those now? Because I mean, you wanna generate those. So what we used is was the process of imprinting spin textures. And again, this is a well-known uh, phenomenon. Finally, what we did is we had a multi-layer magnetic multilayer called platinum, uh, asymmetric with iridium on top, a nanometer, which we knew has a strong DMI, but as well as a PMA and it stabilizes, um, you know, you know, skirmions. We, we knew this before. Um, and then we put on top of this by nanofabrication permalloy disks, which we knew from, again, previous studies, they would be without, you know, just singular, uh, they would be just in a vortex state. So, and this is in plane structure. So what happens if you combine this vortex in-plane configuration together with this out-of-plane skirmion-like DMI structure? 
what would it look like? And, you know, um, the very interesting result was we were able to identify in, in various of these, underneath these disk structures, uh, target squamians that had multiple rotations of the mechanization. And this is just one example, uh, which has one rotation shown and just need to look for how many of those uh, circles are closed and when do they finally break up? And this is how you count. So this is one, this is one, two, this is one, two, three, and this is one, two, three, four. And the diameter here, this is kind of the perimeter of this disc. So, and by varying, of course, the size of the disc, we were able to squeeze more of those kind of target skirmions into, into the system underneath this one here. And now I also have to say that this was possible to image those because we use the elemental specificity at the cobalt edge. I mean, permalized nickel iron doesn't have any cobalt, but we were able to look through the permalite disc just underneath without taking it apart. So this I think was a unique capability of X-ray microscopy to look through a permalite disc that is about a 15 nanometer or so onto the underlying uh, cobalt platinum iridium, iridium pl cobalt platinum disc. And we were able to see that right underneath this disc here, we did see this kind of target scamions. Now you might say, ah, that's nice, that's cool. Why, why is this even interesting? And this now brings me to my next topic, which is the scamions that I showed you early on. And again, they are considered to be, and even the Albert Fair famous movie, they're mostly two dimensional. But quite recently, people started looking into the possibility, not just the possibility, but they realized that wait a bit, the skirmion is, I mean, it's, it's, it, it exists in a, in a pretty significant thickness of a, of, a, of a thin layer, let's say a 50 to 100 nanometers. And that means they're not just on the surface and you cannot just uh, assume that ju they just go straight through. That means there are rigid lines or rigid kind of tubes that go through. No, it, it, it happens. And this is just because, you know, the system doesn't care what the scientists feel, uh, you know, they have, an internal structure across the thickness. And this leads to studies that is really just emerging as we speak. And I think it's exciting. Look into skirmions that really have the full 3D character here. And one of those um, examples, and I just uh, want to mention here, the, the Kyle Bopper system that Unit Group was looking into. These are um, kind of three-dimensional structures where by applying a certain field sequence, you can generate uh, kind of a block point. Basically, you confine the skirmion tube that would normally go straight through the whole stack and the whole thickness. It just stops at some point. And then you, you have now a way, and this is what this paper came up with. I really highly recommend to read it. Uh, you might be able to encode somehow by just applying a certain, you know, uh, magnetic field protocol, the ones and the zeros, which of course, in, in, a, in a normal skirmion two-dimensional system, you don't have this capability. So that's just one way of think about a racetrack made out of three-dimensional skirmions. And the skirmion tubes, and this is uh, the group from Seiki and, and others in, in Japan, I mean, they're really interested and in, they just put a paper in archive. I didn't want to pull it up, but I mean, they again used X-ray microscopy to study the, the structure of the skirmion strings. So again, these are um, uh, kind of, you know, uh, 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 three-dimensional spin textures that are fully three-dimensional. Um, and they also show, and this is shown in this paper here, very interesting dynamics again. I don't think anybody has yet um, in seen any of those dynamics in, in, in real time and in, in real space, but I'm assuming that it won't take long until, you know, people will start looking into the dynamics of the skirmion string. So similar to what I just showed you with our skirmion systems, which we consider still to be two-dimensional. And this brings me now, of course, to the even more exotic uh, uh, topological spin textures, which are the Hopfions. So Hopfions, very simply speaking, uh, let's call them a twisted skirmion tube. So let's say, take one of these skirmion tubes shown here, actually twist them a little bit and, you know, pull them together in this kind of torus-like structure. And what that means now from a topological point of view, you have not only one kind of topological number like we had with the skirmions, the winding number, but now you have basically two. And this comes down to a hop charge, which is a linking number. And the linking number is displayed here. I mean, basically shown here. And for instance, linking number one would be kind of represented by such a cartoon, a linking number three would have kind of one, two, three times twisting it. So it's basically the number of times that a skirmions curved 
magnetic lines are linked with each other. And this leads, and this is paper by Paul Sutcliffe, theoretical extra mathematician from, from Durham, uh, one of my collaborators. And depending on this Hopf number, this is the most simple one, Hopf number one, it's just a ring. But you can then think about some knots and, 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 and you know, more complex structures. Anyway, uh, why did I mention this? And why did I even start with talk about the target skewerments? Uh, Paul Sutcliffe also had a paper and he predicted that these target skirmions could be candidates for generating or creating hopfions in, in chiral magnets. And this is exactly what we were doing just recently uh, and, and trying to find hopfions in multilayers. And what we've done is we started from our work on target skirmions. And this again is a, car a cartoon, a schematics, how the three-dimensional structure of this target skirmion looks like. It's very uniform across. And this is just made by, and I showed you my iridium cobalt platinum system. But if you make this now a little bit more asymmetric, basically what you're doing is you are designing on purpose, on demand, the PMA across the thickness. And by doing this, you can start building these Hopfian structures. So there's certain values of the PMA at the top versus the center, or certain, you know, I mean, this simulation and theory along these lines, but it means you will generate then this Hopfion structure, which is basically two skirmins, but now across in the cross section that are going the opposite direction. And this again is coming because of this twisting and, and, and the linking. Now, what does that mean for us? Let's assume we're able to make that system, which of course we tried. Uh, what would it mean? How do we actually, how can we even analyze and characterize and image this? Because um, you need to find a way to somehow get a three-dimensional uh, sensitivity to your, uh, to your spin texture. And what we took advantage of is the different or the complementarity sensitivity of the PEAM system. The PEAM, which I told you earlier on, is, is basically detecting surface um, you know, spins uh, versus a transmission system, transmission microscopy, which is the full field MTXM, which I also described earlier on. And when you look at the schematics here, you see that if you're just probing the first couple of spins here, and this is the, what the PEAM actually does, and you compare it to the target skirmion, you will see that there's a big difference in the spin texture that you should expect. While when you go straight through, and this is now simulation here showing what to expect, with the TXM, with the transmission full field microscope, we should not see any difference. That means a target skirmion and a hopfion would look more or less the same. But when you combine the results from a transmission geometry with the surface bulk sensitive to the surface sensitive PEAM, you should be able to distinguish whether this system has generated a target skirmion or a hopfion. And this is exactly what we did in the paper was just accepted last week. Now we did a little bit more simulations on this. These characteristic 3D spin textures for the hopfions would also be distinguished from not only the target schemas, but also something that's called a toro. And this is just some simulations. And it's, I mean, in here, the, the color, nice colored, um, you know, uh, structure here, that's kind of a, a contour line of the magnetization inside. But then what we did is we combined up here. This is what a PEAM system, a PEAM image would look like from a toron and the transmission one. And here again, the PEAM from a target schema and the, and the transmission. And again, here, this is the hopfion. So you can see very nicely, this is very characteristic differences, particularly on the PEAM side. The uh, MTXM, of course, would be clearly distinguished between a toron and a hopfion because they look completely different. Here you have this white spot in the center, there's a black spot in the center. It looks completely different. Anyway, again, this is just a little summary. You see this drastic differences between the surface sensitive microscopy and the transmission microscopy. Okay, and these are the results. This is what we found uh, by using both a PEAM at the advanced light source and a full field microscope at Alba in Spain, uh, Mistral beamline. This was again the um, calculated, anticipated, expected PEAM and MTXM images. And this is what we found experimentally. And as you can see, the agreement is, is, is astonishing. I mean, we clearly see this, particularly in the inner part out here, there's a little um, a focusing effect of the PEAM, which we couldn't get rid of. But it's pretty clear that this uh, kind of spin texture that we were able to resolve in full 3D. What we did is here, I, I want to mention this here, the PEAM is of course only probing a certain projection, but when you rotate 
the 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 the, the, the disk and, and the, the system at 90 degrees you can combine these and and really retrieve a fully three-dimensional representation and this is shown here these are real experimental data fully 3d representation of the spin texture here together with the mtxm down here we were able to prove and, and, and demonstrate that yes, we have seen a magnetic hopfion in our designed magnetic multilayer, which was, I think, a big success because we started off from theoretical predictions. We had the pre information from our target skirmion, and they were finally able to prove by this complementary extra microscopy techniques that we're able to see a hopfion. Okay, last topic, I'm almost done. Um, skirmions looking for ultra fast dynamics here now, and this is now an example where we are not going with the real space imaging, but now we're going into diffraction mode. So we basically look into diffraction patterns, diffraction signatures of skirmions. Now, what we did is we used a gadolinium iron multilayer system, again, pretty well known, but interesting system to study. And it was well known from this study here that when you um, change actually at a certain temperature, the magnetic field that's being applied, the the system, the gadolinium iron, goes from a more striped lies, a striped face, and this is characteristic in the diffraction when you have stripes, you see this, you know, linear kind of uh, peaks. It actually transforms by slightly increasing the magnetic field here into this hexagonal pattern. And the hexagonal pattern is then um, the, the the characteristics of a skirmin lattice, and that, so we were able to see around this kind of you know field transition at about room temperature, a transition from a stripe. To skirmion lattice phase. So this was again the pre-experiments that we did and then we said okay and how does actually what's happening to the dynamics right at this transition from a stripe phase to a skirmion phase? Is there anything specific? Is there anything different between a stripe and a skirmion phase? And to study that we went to Stanford and used uh, what's called the x-ray photocorrelation spectroscopy uh, which allows us to uh, basically um, characterize ultra-fast fluctuations nanosecond basically fluctuations with a uh, spatial resolution that's of course given by the you know kind of the the length scales that are uh, you know existing in in the diffraction pattern and particularly we used a new technique at lcls that not only uses the korean flux in the short pulse length but this is kind of a a pair of pulse it's called the two pulse xpcs technique and what it does is you hit the the sample with the first femtosecond pulse and then shortly after this and you can vary the delay time again you hit it again that means you freeze in in the first diffraction pattern, the you know the the the, 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 the timestamp when it's in one fluctuation, and then shortly after that you hit it again, and then you encode basically this kind of multiplexed uh, signal into the CCD detector. And of course, uh, what you have to do is, and this is then the work by Matt Seberg, uh, student, basically deal with these autocorrelations and and deconvoluting the signals there. Anyway, he looked into speckle patterns, calculated autocorrelation. And what we found is, and I think this is a pretty remarkable uh, finding here, we've seen that, and this is shown here in these two uh, graphs here, that when the system is in the skirmion phase at 210 millitesla, a certain field, the kind of the characteristic uh, fluctuation time scales are drastically different than if it was in the stripe phase. So by just slightly changing the field, by slightly basically rearranging the spin configuration in the skirmion system, going from the stripe phase to the skirmion lattice. The fluctuation times, the characteristic fluctuation times, correlation times are vastly different. And this, at least to us or to me, is still, I mean, a very interesting observation because why would the system even care with fluctuation, which sound more like, you know, random, you know, just fluctuations. It looks like there's much more to discover here. And I think this technique of XPCS is probably a way to get access to these ultra fast, random, probably not even random, but coherent or however you want to call this, uh, time scales dynamics that I don't think you can access any other way. Anyway, so with this, and I think I'm done. Sorry, I hope it didn't take too long. So I'll leave some room for questions. Uh, to sum up a little bit my talk here, I hope I could give you some you know, flavor of what magnetic X-ray spectrum microscopies can really do. I think they're uniquely suited to study properties, function, and behavior of very interesting spin textures. We are interested very much in novel spin textures that emerge, particularly in 3D, because they will really open up completely new scientific direction. I showed you some of these examples, but it's it's a it's a wide field that requires 
I mean, in, um, incredible advances, not only in synthesis, but characterization and simulation theory as well. So then I shared with you our latest results on Hopfions, which we observed through this characteristic 3D spin texture by combining PIM and, and, and full field microscopy. Generally, X-rays can really combine ultra fast with ultra small. And the latest uh, ex example I showed you was this two pulse XPCS, where we were able to identify characteristic ultra fast spin fluctuations. And with this, just want to acknowledge this group of people that helped me to, you know, come to all these conclusions. Robert Schreibel, who is now, was my postdoc, he's now a faculty at uh, Nebraska Lincoln. Noah was my previous student, moved on to be a postdoc now in Colorado, and David is my current student. And then this, uh, Christoph um, and Neil, they made samples. This is the group from the foundry, helping with the, uh, you know, electron microscopy, as well as with the nanofabrication. So Joy is the master of the X-ray scattering. James Lee is Steve Command as well. And then it's the group from, from Slack. Uh, UC San Diego from Eric Fullerton's ultimate samples and Paul Sutcliffe was the one who really helped us to understand Hopfions and the theory behind this. And with this, I'd like to thank you. Um, when I made the slide, I was really, I mean, I look back, you know, two years ago, more than two years ago when I was, um, you know, at your place. And I think we went to this beautiful, you know, sightseeing and temple there. And I just found some similarity to this one here. Now, this is the top view of the ELS. It's a very famous fiction. And then I found also that, you know, we had the 90s, um, you know, celebration this year. And you tell me what is completely wrong, but I found on your website at 150 years of celebration of the Mahamata. I would be really interested to, you know, come back and, you know, learn about more on this. And with this, thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Peter, for this excellent overview. So uh, I, I really clap for this excellent talk. Uh, uh, so this year, I think we, we never managed to get more than 50 participants. So you are a star of this year. Uh, it's because I think people could not leave. Uh, it's so nice. Uh, it's just like a beautiful poem, what you just sang uh, for the last 45 minutes. Excellent talk. Uh, so uh, the, the lecture is open for questions. Uh, if you could raise hands or write in chat box, if you have any questions. I don't see right now anything. Uh, let me just kick start. And then, uh, one person Ashish. raised a hand. Ashish Kumanandi raised hand. Uh, yeah. Ashish, please go ahead. Hi, uh, very nice uh, talk. So can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you well. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, actually, I am from NICER also. I am a colleague of uh, Suhunka. So, mm -hmm. uh, so I am very interested on this hop field part, what you said. So you, once uh, you said that there is a skarmian tube and then the chiral bovars. So as per uh, this the theory goes that, that there is a critical uh, thickness uh, above which you, have, you can stabilize the chiral bubble. So is there any, any kind of transition from this tube or some kind of parameter by controlling that you can go from this tube to uh, this uh, option or that there is a transition from a tube to bubble to option like that? Okay, so uh, thank you. Uh, very good question. Um, yeah, let me let me say the following. The Kyle Boppers, my understanding is, I mean, it's it's of course always um, um, you know a balance between different interactions, uh, and it's again you know an exchange with DMI. Um, and as far as I understand, is that the Boppers really are mostly located at the very top. So I mean, the the schematics that I think you know I took from their paper. Uh, is probably a little, you know, simplifying. Um, what would happen if you would decrease the, um, you know, the thickness and you bring it down? I mean, I think the question is finally, where is this transition between where we can still, I mean, consider them to be, you know, two-dimensional and where do we have to take into account the three-dimensional structure? You yeah. know, in a nutshell, I would say the minute you go beyond a couple of exchange lengths and thickness, it's, it has to be a three-dimensional structure. Whether this leads to immediately, you know, um, um, a popper, a, a tube, or hopfion, things like that, that needs to be, you know, basically simulated and, and theoretically predicted. So what we have done in our hopfions, I think we, um, the theorist, um, I'm not even sure whether he had a specific thickness in mind, but he was playing, of course, with the parameters. And of course, I mean, it depends about, I mean, how you put the layers on top of each other, but in the end, it was about how is the PMA distributed across the thickness. And mm -hmm. I would say as long as you have 
this profile of PMA, I would see no specific reason why. And of course, I mean, it, it all comes down once you go beyond, let's say, three exchange lengths, maybe the whole thing changes, right? But once you're above this, I wouldn't see why there should be, you know, any, any much difference. If you're able to generate this profile of, let's call it PMA variation across your, your thickness, I would say that's probably the way to do it. Um, I would, okay. And the other thing is, honestly, <laughs> I mean, the, um, it's not surprising. <laughs> let's put it this way. I mean, it's, yeah, okay. it's not surprising that that you have. I mean, we, we think it's a it's a it's a two dimensional system because it's a thin film. But honestly, it's not, right? I mean, and there are yeah. you know there are the real caps and all that. People know this. Um, there's interesting, you know, even simple vortices uh, in permaloy. You make them like a hundred nanometer thick. This is another example that I know, which we also published. I didn't show them today. But there, I mean, of course, the gyration of the top is almost decoupled from the one at the bottom, right? Uh, now it comes down to what is the damping in there. I mean, you really have to go into those fundamental material parameters, but then it becomes straightforward. It becomes, I would say, almost natural. Why didn't people do it so far? Well, first of all, how do you control it? <laughs> Number one. Second, that means how you create those structures, right? I mean, you have to have a certain mastery of, you know, making those structures, you know, just perfect, right? Um, let me put it, uh, let me close this here by, by just saying the following. I believe that our community goes two ways now. One is, these are the fascinating, you know, phenomena that are really in 2D, fully 2D. You have this monolayer, you have this plane, you know, really, I mean, you know, absolutely 2D. And then the minute you go a little bit above the exchange length and thickness, this is 3D. And, and these wow. are probably two, the two directions that I would expect in a, Already now we're seeing this. I mean, people are going this route. Um, another so, thing, I was not was not too specific on this this curvilinear magnetism, right? Where I certainly bidding a little bit about you know an exchange itself is not exchange anymore because I mean if you're on a on a curved surface and this could even be a defect a defect, right? This could even be a little hump some a little hump somewhere, and all of a sudden what you think is a plane. 2D system with a well-defined, you know, exchange ex interaction and parallel, it's not. And the minute you, you you start canting those spins just because there is a surface where they need to follow the, the topology, you have an intrinsic kind of almost something like a DMI. And all of a sudden there are, you know, not to say that, of course, maybe the, the, the pinning, uh, you know, power of this defect is stronger than anything else, but let, let this aside, just look at the, the pure geometry of this. Right? And this is, I think, yeah. what's so exciting. And we're able to do now a full control on the synthesis side, really at these nanoscales. And characterization is also coming along. Anyway, I hope that answers yeah. a little bit your question. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I got the idea. Thank it's you. It's exciting. You. It's exciting. And I think it's opening a completely new avenue that we're going right now. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks, Asis. Thanks, Victor. Uh, Chandra Sekhar, you have a question. Please go ahead. Yeah, th thank you, Professor Bankar. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Professor Peter. I thoroughly enjoyed your talk. I would like to ask something uh, which you could have mentioned, but uh, some basic question that how is this Hopion uh, can be related to the block point domain wall in cylindrical nanowires? Is there any uh, relation there? And how does the what uh, the, the chirality changes from top to bottom? Is it still same or it, is it going to switch the chiral chirality? Uh, so I don't think... I don't think, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but I don't think that a Hopfion needs to have a block point. I don't think so. Uh, okay. The Hopfion is, is, I mean, the way we designed it, as I said, it was really this kind of um, the, um, you know, the, the, the PMA across the thickness. And I would not say that there's an immediate connection to block point, but there's another work uh, which you're probably referring to by Claire Nelly, where they have looked into three-dimensional spin textures, um, you know, yes. it, yeah. the block point actually is, is where I would say the exchange interaction is kind of going to infinity, right? I mean, this is where you have to undetermined exchange interaction. But what I, I would say that in the, on the hop front, we still have a clear understanding what exchange interaction is at any given point in, in this space. And that's why I think probably there's not block points, but I would not exclude it that maybe when you look closer into the details of hop front, there might even be some Dynamics. I mean, okay, <laughs> I didn't say that, but we're also looking right now and trying to do some option dynamics 
And there I could see some block points again emerging, same similar what we have done with the vortices. Again, mm -hmm. when it's just when you have vortex dynamics in a 3D system where they do the, the opposite chirality for that refers to your question, it is of course in the center when it flips yes. from one to the other, there is a block point. Okay. So I think that's probably also, I would expect, I wouldn't exclude it for now, I can't tell, but I would not exclude that even in a hot field, there will be some singularities that you know we have to look at. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Chandra. Um, so I have one or two questions. Um, this target scorpion, what you were telling, I think some other people call it scorpion, isn't it? The scormionium, yes, uh, Garrett van der and others, uh, yes. The scormionium is actually the n equal two. <laughs> okay. It, it's, so it's exactly the same. It's exactly the same, and you probably have seen this, these papers from, I think, particular Garrett um, published quite a few papers on this. Um, I think what we found in our papers, we went even beyond it. But now, let me let me say, be honest, and just you know, <laughs> bring us down to earth is, uh, and this was a little, I would say, disappointing, but you know. Sovereign. Um, the stability of the n equal one rotation versus the n equal four rotations, target scamions, and you might call it scamioniums or n pi vortices, it doesn't matter, didn't change. Um, so that means the, the stability of the structure itself was only determined by the skirmion at the very center. So that means these multiple rotations didn't really add too much of a new science to this. But again, we use them then as a precursor for the Hopfions. And this, I think, is probably the more exciting you know, outcome from, from this uh, result on the target scamions. But it's scamionium for n equal 2. That's right. Yeah, but, but the advantage of, uh, of the scamionium, or what we call target scamionium, that they will be free from the scamion Hall effect. Is it? Yes, and, and we have not done any of those experiments yet. Yes, uh, but but in, uh, theoretically, what we would in principle expect that. And a similar line uh, on this uh, Hopmions, uh, do you think they will be uh, affected by the gyroscopic force? They, they will have excellent, excellent question. Thank you for asking this. I forgot to say it. That's the reason why that's so interesting. They don't have it. They don't have these deviation that the skirmions have. That's, that's, I think, probably the, the most important. And there's a paper from, uh, I think, Anne Bratash. Uh, which is very explicit and say the Hopfions don't have this, you know, kind of drifting to the side. So okay. put a scramion in 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 a whatever racetrack, it will sit, it would fl fly just in the middle without being, you know, um, deviated uh, to the left or to the right. Um, you know what I think you just talked about, which of course uh, people in the scramion business try to compensate through some tricks. I think they have some synthetic interferon magnets. I don't know what they're doing. Um, basically, compensating this, you know, drifting to the left to the right, which of course is the limitation when you have the scramions on the track. So I mean, Albert's, you know, famous movie in reality, and there's now plenty of studies shown this. It's not there. So this, I think that's what you're referring to, this kind of drifting to the side, right? This, this whatever uh, effect, um, uh, Magnus effect, something like this. A Hopfion doesn't have that. The gyro vector is not there. That's probably the most important, uh, I would say from an application point of view, is probably one of the most important things to look into. That's why I think these Hopfions are so exciting, right? <laughs> because all of a sudden you get rid of this, right? Nevertheless, um, can we think about, you know, something like this higher order Hopfions? <laughs> you know, this is a little bit pie in the sky right now, <laughs> but it's exciting. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, just uh, one last question from my side on a more technical uh, point of view. So, uh, because I remember for the MTXM, you need the samples to be deposited on a, a grid. So, uh, like a 75 nanometer or 100 nanometer yeah. grid. Yes. So is it uh, same? The, is it still the same uh, way, or you can somehow work with uh, thin films deposited on a regular substrate? So, um, okay. I mean, <laughs> transmission. Um, it's it's called transmission X-ray microscopy. Uh, the transmission of soft X-rays is limited by physics, by nature. We can't change that. Um, 
and therefore you still have to put them on substrate or thin the area down like you do with the TEM. I mean, I always like to say, you know, the TEM has similar challenges than the TX and they're actually about the same. It just replaced the E by an X, but the, 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 the penetration power of electrons is almost the same than you would do with X-rays, soft X-rays, not hard X-rays. Um, now there is of course, particularly on the scanning X-ray side, there are ways that people can put them on solid substrates. Uh, the reason is because in a TXM, you can detect different uh, modes, like you can probe the, the local generation of currents, right? So when the X-ray is hidden in a lo uh, the special location, there's a current and you just record what's the current and you rest the scan across the sample. So if you really would like to do X-ray microscopy real space with a sample that is not transparent for the X-rays, then I would recommend consider a Stixum just because it's probably a little easier. Uh, keep in mind that a Stixum is a scanning microscope. Scanning means it takes much longer. Scanning means, you know, you take point by point by point, right? I mean, there's, there's pros and cons for, for both of them. Um, but you're right. Um, if you want to do transmission extra microscopy, the sample has to be, you know, transmissive. <laughs> it's what the name already says, right? And that, that this will not change. I, I, I mean, I don't make too often predictions, but I would say this will not change because it's, I mean, x-rays will not, you can't push them further through. There's no way. They stop at some yeah. point. Yes. Uh, so, as you said, uh, so one way is to deposit the thin film on a, like a carbon grid or silicon grid of 75 to 100 nanometer. So the yeah. other way, uh, if uh, we uh, prepare the sample for cross-sectional DM, okay, and that, let's say, on a, with, uh, which is deposited on a silicon substrate or something else, and we just use uh, the standard methods to uh, make a cross-sectional EM. Uh, so those samples can be used for the transmission X-ray microscopy or not? Um, you know, as long as the X-rays somehow are able to go through the sample and make it to the detector, you can use them, right? Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, as long as, as you find a way to, to make this happen, you should be able to use this apart from, of course, the more technical challenges, right? I mean, if, if this kind of arrangement doesn't fit into the, into the whole system, then of course you have a problem. Um, particularly on the, on the 3D tomography that I, you know, didn't talk too much about this, but we took some very nice data. I just want to, you know, verbally communicate this with you because, uh, uh, there's other ways to do this, right? I mean, you basically just hold somehow the structure, you know, somehow in space, and then you start rotating this. That's an even, and there, there I would say the, um, you know, the, the, the membranes themselves are not the most preferred sample preparation, right? But it brings different challenges, right? Okay. It's, uh, it's, I mean, it's interesting to Panka, I, I highly recommend that you just basically reach out to the beamline scientist with a specific question and ask them, what can you do to help me engineer this into something that I can use this tool? Or if they say, you know, I don't see any way that will do this, uh, they might advise you to say, you know, but there's another tool that will probably give you similar results. And this yes. is what I try to show with my overview slides. There's a whole, I mean, set of tools that you can use and all of them have their specifics, the requirements, they're not the same in terms of can this sample go here and there and they br bring you, you know, roughly similar information, roughly. Yeah, so I, I, I will write you later. Uh, so we are working on some synthetic antiferromagnets and some new scarmining systems, uh, mm -hmm. but they're always on a, like a silicon substrate or uh, some other substrates. So, uh, uh, of course, we cannot do TXM, but we can make the uh, like sample preparation with the PIT. We have those facilities in NYSER. So I would like to you, and if it is feasible, then we will see. Absolutely. I'm, I'm more than happy to, you know, <laughs> finally. Yeah. You know, yes. um, um, the ELS um, is uh, going into an upgrade. I think you probably know this. Um, uh, and this is coming soon. So, this is a big, a big thing because they will uh, be transformed into what's called a coherent diffraction light source. So again, much more coherence. 
and there's but with this comes also new technologies new instruments that are being developed um, one of them we don't know yet whether we get the money for this but could be even a um, a very interesting system where we might be able to do even some reflection microscopy. So basically, look into spin textures under in in you know in looking at bird interfaces. This is still something that I think is is completely missing in, on this planet. Nobody is able to really look into a bird interface and and look at the spins you know while they are kind of moving through an interface. It would be fantastic, but let's wait and see. <laughs> Yeah, that would be very exciting. Looking forward to that. Uh, there is one question from a student, I guess. Uh, he is telling uh, we drawings of analogy, analogy between magneto-optic core effect and XMCD. In yeah. what aspect comparison can be drawn between these two techniques? Okay. I think you Let me just go back and sorry, I was probably a little too um, fast on this, but you know, since I was not completely sure who is in the audience. Um, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. Here we go. Where's my XMCD slide? Sorry, I'll be there in a second. Here we go. Okay, so that is the slide that should explain um, the relationship. So um, XMCD, extra magnetic circular diagram. Um, you, you basically take uh, photons with a specific energy and a certain helicity and you shine onto the, mag on the magnetic materials. So once the, the photon energy that you apply here, this is shown that you basically have a monochromatin and you just vary the, the photon energy. Once it matches the binding energy of this inner core electron, this electron gets excited. And the difference I would say between Kerr microscopy, optical Kerr microscopy and X-ray magnetic circular diagram spectroscopy in that sense is that the states that are involved with the X-rays are very localized, well-defined 2p3 half states. So we know exactly that the signal here in this absorption profile, so that means the interaction, the transmission, the absorption, is 100% coming from that electron down here. And I think in a Kerr microscope, where of course, I mean, you come in with polarized light, so that's the similarity, you come with polarized light, onto magnetic materials, and then you reflect off or you do some transmission in Faraday, whatever. Um, and then the magnetization actually changes slightly the, the, the incoming light. So that means the outgoing light has a little rotation, you know, of the polarization, things like that. That means you, you modify the, 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 the photons in, in the Kerr microscopy and the Kerr effect. And, but you're basically having transition that are right here. They're not, I mean, they're not, deep, I mean, the localized, um, you know, states deep in the atom. That is the huge difference. That means you know exactly with X-ray, XMCD, that this is your state where you start from. And then because of uh, angular momentum, uh, you know, um, conservation, energy conservation, um, you know, this electron here gets polarized because of the polarization of the incoming light and it knows exactly which state it populates. And that's given because of the, the energy here. So I think this is the big difference. The optical microscopy is scratch in the, in the electronic structure picture, more or less the outer surface or the, the outer electrons, and it's not clear. I don't think that you can guarantee me that in an, in a, in an optical transition, you picked up the S, the P, or the D electrons. With X-rays, you know exactly. This is the P2, three half electron at in this case, 777 electron volts. So if the X-rays have 778 electron volts, this is the response from a 2p3 half electron. And I think this is the big, big difference. And with this comes, of course, then the quantification here. Does that explain, answer the question that the student had? I just want to add, uh, Peter, that, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, basic principle-wise, this is the similarity or difference. But the resolution-wise, the car microscope is limited by the optical limit, so it will be few hundred nanometers. But mm -hmm. for the oh, uh, yes, <laughs> uh, no, I mean, uh, Supanka, of course, I mean, length scales um, scale, of course, with the probe, right? And of course, with a one nanometer probe, you should be able to probe 
uh, of one nanometer length scale while with an optics, you, you just cannot. That's why optics is called microscopy. Actually, we should rename all our microscopy to be nanoscopy. That would be a yeah. better phrase. But we just yes. keep it with microscopy because we're used to this. But in the end, and, 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 and I didn't talk about this. I think the, the big difference is, and, and this is very, I think, um, you know, critical. It is this, the process, the fundamental process that we are looking into this absorption here that is leading because of the helicity changes uh, to the XMCD effect shown here. It is because we know exactly where we start from. There's no doubt. There's not, I mean, it can, I mean, at 778, it's not an S electron. It's not a D electron. It's not even a 2P1 half electron. It's the 2P3 half electron, which has a well-defined spin and orbital configuration. It's absolutely clear what the initial state is. And with this, because we also know it's, a, you know, it's a dipolar transition, you know exactly what the end state is. You know exactly, you know, in the matrix element that describes this process, you know exactly where you come from. And in optics, and you know much better than I do, you don't. You just don't know. You can't tell this photon, this optical photon picked up the S electron and made it into the P with this character. You don't, you just don't. And this is the big difference, right? Now, I have to say the big advantage of Kerr effects is of course you can use very fast lasers, right? And you have a pretty significant, you know, that's, I mean, but, Length scales, I think you're limited. And in terms of interpretation of what the signal tells you, the quantification, you're limited. Yeah, I mean, just to add for the benefit of the students. So as you explained very nicely, uh, it's energy sensitive. So uh, okay. if your sample consists of many magnetic elements, so this XMCD can be element specific, but core microscope is just the average of everything. We cannot do elements uh, specific. Okay, one can do with much more, uh, complications, but it's not that straightforward. So, I think um, I, I hope for, you, ask uh, Schaefer, you ask Rudy Schaefer, and of course, he has some smart ways to do this, but he also has to admit there's a limitation. Yes, 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 it is. Okay, uh, I think he got, I'm sure, his answer. So, uh, Peter, again, many, many, many thanks for your excellent lecture. I have got many WhatsApp messages from some of the participants that your talk was very nice, and they thank me, but actually, it is, I have done nothing except uh, inviting you. It is all your uh, hard efforts. Excellent uh, things are going on. And thank you very much again for taking the trouble to give the lecture so late in the night. So I hope we'll be done. We'll meet sometime soon, either in India or in the States or in Germany. Or so somewhere we'll else. see. Or yeah. somewhere else. Uh, okay. <laughs> so we'll never know. Okay. All no, right. Thanks. So, so thank you again very, very much. And uh, uh, please stay safe and uh, stay in touch. And uh, yeah, have a good night. So Same see you next you. week. Same to you. you. the rest of your day. And I hope to all see you all. And if you have any yeah. chance to come to Berkeley, you're more than welcome. Just let me know.